you who may not. Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again John Rubino. John is very well known on this show. He's been on a number of times. Uh, We just mentioned that uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with him, uh, go to dollarcollapse.com, dollarcollapse.com to pick up John's work and uh, links to a lot of other great sites and great articles. I think John handpicks articles that he thinks are very important and need to be out there. Uh, in uh, and spread out to the to the public as much as he can, uh, and so um, he, he's also the author of a, of a couple of great books that he co-authored a couple of them with uh, James Turk, and um, so uh, welcome, John. It's really good to have you with me again. Hey, Jay. Good to talk to you again. You know, I uh, mentioning James Turk. You uh, you and James co-authored uh, a book. Uh, in the past, and uh, one of our listeners sent in an email, and he wanted to know if I might get your opinion on Bitgold as a uh, and gold money as a way to own gold. Uh, you know, I, I responded to the uh, to the listener uh, saying that, well, uh, you know, it's, you're not that uh, that involved with Bitgold, if if at all. But uh, of course, James Turk is, and we'll have James on our show sometime, sometime, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, but do you have any thoughts about Bitgold and um, and its capabilities of, of providing and maybe remonetizing gold? Well, I love the concept of bringing gold into the modern monetary system because yeah, you know we have the technology now, at least in theory, to turn gold back into a currency that trades and that is portable and and you know that's huge if it can work, and that's what gold money is attempting. And I'm not. Um, technically well enough versed in what they're doing to have a good opinion about whether they'll succeed or not. But it looks like so far so good. They're um, they're drawing a lot of customer attention. They're uh, managing quite a bit of money now. And they seem to be ramping up without um, any kind of technical glitches. So I, I think their first year in operation is really promising. And if they can live up to their ideals, you know, if they can um, manage the system the way they're intending to, then you will end up with, for instance, a debit card Mm -hmm. that you can take with you when you travel around the world and use to um, convert the gold in a bank vault that they're managing for you into local currency, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because the, the, one of the big problems with owning physical gold is that it's pretty hard to take with you when you go somewhere. You know, it sits it sits where it is, and there's, a, you know, a risk inherent in you leaving it in one place and going to another place. And it doesn't allow you to move it with, with you. If you decide you want to leave a country for whatever reason, because the country is becoming financially and uh, politically unstable, for instance, it's really hard to take a lot of gold bullion with you. But if you've got a, a gold money account, that is linked to your debit card. You take the debit card with you, and basically you're taking your gold with you, um, in theory. And um, so it'll be interesting to see in the years ahead if this works out in practice. And as I said, I think so far the start is very promising. Yeah, indeed. Uh, In fact, I have in my hands right now a gold money MasterCard. It's a debit card uh, that, uh, that has worked. Uh, I had some issues at certain at gas pumps and various places, but I the last I tried to use it, it worked. And the way it works is you have your gold account that you know, it, and the value of that gold account changes with the price of gold. Then at any time when you want to take, you want to sell some gold and turn it into dollars, you do that and put it into your gold money Mastercard or Bitgold Mastercard uh, debit account. Uh, and then you can take it to a store and buy things, and I've used it, so it, it actually does work. I know it works. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure that it works as well as I'd like it to yet because I have I, it had some glitches, but but it, it is very interesting. So I just want to get your thoughts on that, John, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to turn to some of the um, some of the uh, some of the topics that you've featured on your uh, Dollar Collapse website. One uh, that you put out there: Why interest rates can't go much lower. And you, uh, you know, you you posted five charts: the Japanese uh, GDP chart, uh, Japan inflation rate chart. Uh, you showed the EU GDP growth rate and the EU 
uh, inflation rate and then the Deutsche Bank uh, share price chart, which is uh, going down very dramatically or has over the last year or so, uh, last number of months anyway, uh, reflecting a decline substantial decline in the profits of Deutsche Bank. Well, uh, h- help us understand. I mean, we were just talking to Michael Oliver, whose technical work is suggesting very, uh, very, very certainly in his view, and, and he has been so spot on on so many markets, very certainly that we are seeing the end or a blow-off phase. We may have actually seen, he thinks, a peak in the T-bond rate. Um, but uh, tell us why, you know, from a fundamental point of view, Tell us why you think we can't go much lower in interest rates. Well, if you look at the first four charts that you mentioned, Jay, that was mm-hmm. the basically the economic statistics from um, Japan and Europe, where where interest rates are negative almost across the board. Yeah, um, it hasn't worked. Their economies are kind of flatlining, or in, in Japan's case, dropping back into. Um, um, deflation. Yeah. So clearly, negative interest rates didn't ignite the rip roaring boom that Keynesian economic theory says should happen. And and so mainstream economists basically look at that and say, well, let's just do more. You know, if, if yeah. negative one percent doesn't work, let's do negative five percent or whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, this is happening. The the big financial institutions like banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and money market funds, and individual savers are all being crushed by negative interest rates. There was just a story um, uh, about Japanese banks that came out last week that said Jap- uh, the big Japanese bank profits are now almost – three billion dollars a year lower than they would be otherwise in a normal interest rate environment wow. and pushing interest rates down further will hurt the banks even more and the um, the deutsche bank price chart kind of illustrates the damage that's being done you know deutsche bank was 53 dollars a share in 2014 now it's 14 dollars a share and this is europe's biggest strongest bank supposedly yeah. so there there's apparently a limit to how low interest rates can go without blowing up most of the financial sector because you can't run a pension fund if your entire fixed income portfolio um, is earning you nothing or less than nothing. Same thing with an insurance company. And if you're an individual, you can't save for retirement and you can't be retired if the safe stuff that used to generate you a reasonable income now costs you money to invest in. So we're perverting the financial system by um, lowering interest rates to this point. And I'm not saying we won't try some new monetary experiment, but I, I am saying that it seems that the unintended consequences, the negative effects of, of um, negative interest rates are beginning to loom very large. And so probably what we'll do next is some variation of the debt jubilee in which governments just create a whole bunch of new currency and give it to people in some way, either through some big infrastructure program or tax cuts or just direct purchases of individuals' assets. You know, maybe they buy your house for twice its market value, something like that. And, in you know, that doesn't rely on interest rates and therefore might not hurt the banks and so it might be more politically palatable for the the people who actually run the government, which is to say the uh, the, the big finance people, you know, the one percent who run the big banks, who um, own the favored accounts at the big banks. Um, they're kind of tired of negative interest rates, and since <laughs> in a lot of cases they're in charge of national governments, or at least they're. They're staffing the important positions in the Treasury Department of most mm-hmm. national governments. Goldman um, Sachs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you got to figure that the U.S. government, which normally does what Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase wants, will do so in the future because they they literally own the Fed. The big banks own the Fed. You know, people don't realize that the Fed isn't a government institution. It's actually a, a private sector entity that is owned by a consortium of big banks. And sure. so it's no surprise that they do what their bosses want. And it, increasingly, their bosses want higher interest rates or at least not a continued decline in interest rates. So if rates continue to go down, that's the market overriding the will of the big players in the financial markets, which will be very interesting. And, it, it, you know, it could happen. But there's already $13 trillion of, of negative yield debt floating around the world. And there might actually even be more than that when you consider that for um, a Japanese investor 
or a European investor to buy treasury bonds, normally they, they buy the bonds and then they hedge the currency risk that comes with mm-hmm. buying a bond that pays you in a different currency. And mm-hmm. when you include the hedging costs, U.S. treasuries have negative yields for mm-hmm. those investors now too. Wow. So wow. that that might increase the actual amount of negative yield debt in the world. And, and you know, it's hard to see how much further we can go into the uh, tens of trillions of dollars. So, um, uh, Well, it's very know. interesting. I, I noticed this morning that uh, Dudley at the, at the New York Fed, uh, he's been talking about talking up this notion of, of, of higher rates. Uh, and yet, John, you know, whenever they start to talk higher rates, it has a, a negative impact on the equity market. So people are screaming and hollering about the declining value of their stock. So we have a tug and a pull here, don't we? It's not we, one side or the other. And if, if I look at the, uh, I mean, explaining maybe to our listeners why uh, such low rates are bad for banks. And uh, if, I think it, uh, this is my understanding of it. Banks, they tend to borrow short-term and lend long-term, and if the long end of the yield curve is coming down, and if the short end is negative and the long end is virtually almost negative or or very skimpy on the positive side, then there's no margin there left for the banks, right? Well, and that's what's happening to the banks, among yeah. other things. But one of the things that's happening is that the uh, the money they make on a given loan is shrinking. Right. And but but it also um, means that see when you distort the financial markets by manipulating every major asset class the way the governments of the world are doing now, it makes it harder for the big bank uh, big banks trading desks to yeah. make any money. And that's where the the big profits used to come from for mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs and, and to an extent J P Morgan Chase. Uh, they would set up trading desks that basically you know place a bet on something and then somebody else from the trading desk moves the market towards the uh, the original bet and they make money that way. In other words, they manipulate the markets. But if you have governments coming in and indiscriminately manipulating markets by, for instance, having central banks buy equities across the board, which is what mm-hmm. they're doing now, mm-hmm. uh, you make it harder for the big banks. In other words, you have a bigger predator in the market. The, and, and so the smaller predators at the, uh, the commercial banks uh, can't manipulate their markets as easily as they used to. And so they don't make money. And so the, the big banks don't have any way to make money now. You know, investment banking is not going so well. Uh, lending certainly isn't. Trading is a, a loss-making proposition now for a lot of them. And so they're in, in – grave danger and they're having to shrink you know um, Deutsche Bank to go back to that example is laying people off right and left taking massive um, losses with every earnings report and uh, shrinking in, in you know they're, they're completely eliminating certain lines of business and they're turning into a smaller entity because they can't function um, as a financial supermarket anymore and I think it's true for most of the big banks now and that's that's a very big deal because finance has become so dominant in the global economy. Right, right. And, and finance is the most important industry, and it's shrinking. Um, it it makes it hard for the global economy to grow because what's left, you know, is is oil or something like that going to make up the take up the slack with banking? Mm-hmm. Is, is mm-hmm. and, and that's not going to happen. So mm-hmm. it's hard to see where we generate growth if. The big finance entities are shrinking, and energy is, if not shrinking, not growing anymore. You know what? What is left? Really, retailing? <laughs> that's, yeah, no, that's not. A no, very, no, that's not very promising either, yeah. because everybody's broke, and they've, uh, you know, pretty much have maxed out uh, to a great extent. Well, it seems to me. I mean, if you're talking about a debt jubilee, I think is the terminology, or the the notion of debt forgiveness, I guess. And what you're saying is, politically more palatable way might be helicopter money, printing money. And sending it to the masses, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, these are all terms for basically the same thing, which, as you said, is creating new currency and giving it to people. It's another term for it is QE for the people. And and they, they all mean largely the same thing. The details of how they do it might vary from country to country. You know, some countries are talking about a guaranteed, um, individual income where they give you 8,000 euros a year if you're in Europe. Yeah. Or uh, five thousand Swiss francs, or yeah. something like that, which is basically that's what it is. You know, they're they're giving you money, and you can, if you want to, pay off your debts, and, or yeah. 
spend it, which is what the Keynesian economists would love. You know, they'd love you to spend that money and then borrow some more money against your future guaranteed government income and spend yeah. that. And um, the, um, the downside of this is pretty obvious, which is that we'd be creating huge amounts of new currency. And supply and demand 101 says that with an increase in supply of that magnitude, you've got to have a commensurate decrease in value. Mm-hmm. And so we end up destroying the value of our currencies, which, check this out, Jay, here's where it gets really interesting. If you're a, a rational actor in finance and somebody, you know, the government announces that they're going to do this and you understand that it's going to make the currency less valuable year after year, what's your rational response? It's to borrow as much money as possible, right? Sure, because you're going to sure. be paying it back in cheaper currency. Sure. And so you end up, in, in trying to do a debt jubilee that eliminates debt, you end up increasing the amount of debt in the system by encouraging everybody who can borrow to borrow. Right. And so you get the blow-off phase of this 70-year-long credit bubble, uh, which ends with a crash that is unlike anything we've ever seen before because we already have more debt per capita and more debt nominally, you know, in gross numbers than we had in 1929 by far. You know, we're much more indebted now than we were before the Great Depression. And so when this thing blows up, all bets are off. There's going to be no way to predict what happens exactly, except you know it's going to be crazy. You know it's going to be um, um, incredibly painful for the average person, obviously, mm-hmm. because they're yeah. the ones who always suffer from government financial mismanagement. But I think it's going to be bad for a lot of other people who think they're going to get through this in good shape, too. You know, uh, uh, What we're seeing now with hedge funds is an interesting example of that. Um, mm-hmm. Hedge funds. Yeah, what are they doing? They're, they're yeah. having a hard time making money. They are. They can't the figure out the smartest guys on Wall Street. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, they've generally been considered to be the smartest guys in the finance world, the hedge fund managers. And one after another, they're reporting terrible numbers. And then the, uh, the clients, the pension funds and the university endowments and the big foundations are pulling their money out of these hedge funds. And they're having to lay people off and in some cases close down big brand name hedge funds because these guys cannot figure out these markets. So it, it's highly likely that a lot of people who think they're bulletproof because they've got the smartest advisors working yeah. for them and they're paying them, you know, 2% a year on their money and 20% of the profits, you know, huge fees for yeah. brilliant, supernaturally brilliant financial advice. Yeah. They're going to get burned too. <laughs> well, John, uh, we're just about out of time here, but I have to, I just have to make note of Bill Gross's remarks about a week ago or so. And uh, I'm sure you've you've seen this, but he, and heard what he had to say. I mean, I, I believe uh, he said something to the effect that he doesn't want to buy stocks or bonds, and he's suggesting that we should buy the things that the Fed has not yet bought, like gold and land. Huh? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, well, you don't get anybody smarter than Bill Gross. Anybody more mainstream than Bill Gross, essentially saying the system is so screwed out, screwed up, that you better get out of it and buy gold. And tangibles, huh? Yeah, yeah. And and he is joining a long list of heavy hitters who are saying the same thing. I mean, George yeah. Soros loaded up wow. on gold a year ago. And Carl Icahn, you know, these guys who are basically free to buy anything yeah. and and have no problem going very long when yeah. the, the situation is appropriate. Now now they're going defensive. You know, they're, they're yeah. going risk off in a big way. And I, I think we should pay attention to, to what I these guys I think we should with, pay attention to what yeah. the smart guys are saying. Yeah. And, of course, uh, you and James Turk and a lot of other guests on our show have been early on saying that we need to start doing that. But now when you see the likes of those mainstream guys saying it, I think you really have to take note. The time is probably very near in which uh, we're going to have a lot of chaos unfortunately but it is what it is and we want to plan as best we can john we are basically out of time now i want to thank you very much for being with us and never enough time with you we'll have you back again sometime in the near future all right great thanks jay